All right, now that you've read the letter to Minoicus, let's look at some of the conclusions that Epicurus draws in that letter. First, let's talk about some misunderstandings. This picture of drunken revelry is not, according to Epicurus, hedonistic. These people are experiencing a kind of pleasure, as we'll discuss in just a moment, but on the whole, they've made a major miscalculation. As you can see from the fellow at the bottom of the picture, the behaviors that they are practicing right now will not, in the end, yield a life of pleasure. In fact, they're going to yield a life of misery and pain on the whole. Second misunderstanding is about the word Epicurean. Now, you wouldn't have maybe gathered this from the letter, but spend much time in food magazines, and you'll see the word Epicurean routinely used to refer to gourmet to the finer things of life. This is not, of course, what Epicurus means by uh, his own doctrine of pleasures. He's not encouraging young Minoicus to pursue the luxuries of life. He's actually trying to direct the young man, and of course all of us, to the simpler things of life. This takes us to the taxonomy of desire. Now don't get too uh, hung up on the word taxonomy there. You've used it in science. It means the same thing here. It's a system of classification. Okay, so this is a way of understanding human desire and, of course, ranking it and making a rational decision about which desires we ought to be uh, fulfilling and which that we ought to be restraining or ignoring. Before we look at the, class, uh, the classification, though, let's remember this one little quote. <laughs> every pleasure is a good thing because its nature is favorable to us, yet not every pleasure is to be chosen. Now, the picture I showed you of the drunken revelry there is pleasure in that, according to Epicurus. Um, it would be ridiculous to deny it. Uh, people would not drink uh, alcohol the way they do. They would not use um, they would not use illegal drugs if these things did not yield some kind of pleasure. Epicurus is not trying to convince us of the counterintuitive idea that these things don't give pleasure. He's simply saying sometimes they're not worth it. Okay. And if we think carefully about which pleasures and which, especially which desires we uh, work to fulfill, we will find that the pathway to a life of consistent, ongoing, unbroken pleasure actually isn't that hard to come by. So let's look at the taxonomy. So let's start with basic desire. Desire, of course, is the impulse towards something. It is the sense that something is wanted. And these desires can be, of course, natural or unnatural. Now, examples of unnatural desire there are fame and immortality. Let me clarify that these desires do not, on any case, yield happiness because they are desires for things that don't really quite exist. Um, so there are pleasures of the mind that you perhaps could say a person thinks, you know, like I, he would, he might admit that a person who um, is famous and who enjoys some celebrity status, that perhaps they have a kind of pleasure of the mind because of the illusion that they have some sort of good thing. Um, but by and large, Epicurus is saying these things, they, they're just not, they're not even part, they don't arise from your body, they aren't part of your, your needs, they don't actually give you a sensation of pleasure. Um, it's because we are basically deceived and ignorant that we pursue them at all. So of course, those are off the list. We want to like focus on our natural desires, and those can be decided divided into two categories as well. They are the necessary desires, such as food, shelter, and friendship, and the unnecessary desires, such as fine wine, dessert, luxury, cruises, and the like. Um, now, an important point to note here is that, uh, you know, Epicurus isn't saying that unnecessary desires are a sin. He, he doesn't have that category in mind even. For him, there is no sin or wickedness in the traditional sense of those words. For him, it's just a matter of what will or will not yield a long life of perpetual happiness. So he doesn't, I mean, I don't think he would deny that fine wine tastes great or that dessert has a certain pleasure to it, um, that there's a, there's a real uh, pleasure to be had in a luxury vacation. His point is that these things are very hard to come by and so generally ought to be avoided. And he says, if you don't live your life kind of growing accustomed to those things, you could, in fact, enjoy them better than some people. Um, let me give you a personal example of this. Um, my wife and I have 
on occasion saved up some money or received a gift and were able to go to Highlands Bar and Grill, which is one of the finest, if not the finest, restaurant in Birmingham, owned by Frank Stitt, who is a James Bearden uh, Award winner, um, which is an internet kind of like the international uh, equivalent of a Nobel Prize or something in food. Anyway, it's a great restaurant. It's fantastic, and we were there, we were there one time, and just kind of you know completely intoxicated by this delicious food, and you know just every bite slowly chewing, thinking about how wonderful this was, you know detecting all the artistry that was put into this beautiful cuisine. And over next to us was a a, a, a small family who were eating, and I overheard the man ordering, and he was an older man, clearly. Uh, dressed well, uh, frequented this place often, and said, you know, oh, I've never ordered the bone marrow. Why don't I just, I've been here, you know, I've been coming here for years. Uh, never ordered that. I can't believe it. Let's try it tonight. And so it was, here we were, my wife and I were like on our, you know, semi -an or biannual pilgrimage to this wonderful restaurant. This guy eats here all the time. For him, it's kind of boring. I mean, the things that he had ordered all the time, they he'd gotten used to them. He just ordered something weird just to spice it up, you know? So in a sense, my wife and I were better equipped to enjoy that restaurant than he was, uh, even though he could afford to go there all the time because we got there, it was a real treat. For him, it was something he had all the time. So Epicurus, like I would say, don't, you know, don't shun these luxuries of life. Just understand they're not necessary. And in fact, they end up being kind of hard to come by. So you can exhaust yourself and frustrate yourself if those become your normal pursuits. The real gold standard is just the necessary natural desires. So tonight, I'm sorry, tomorrow, you'll be reading a, a short story called The Tao of the Dumpster about a man who finds out just how easy it is to fulfill the natural and necessary desires of human life. Now, as you read this story, you're going to notice two things. One, you're going to notice the interesting... Um, art of dumpster diving that this fellow discovers, you're also going to notice the incredible dysfunction of his family. So I want to discuss both of those with you, but I also want you to go ahead and make up your mind to bracket them a little bit. Pay attention to his family. The dynamics there are, are, are kind of sad, and there's, like I said, a lot of dysfunction. But I want you to, on a separate kind of category, look at his discovery, okay, and think about what this father figures out in life, okay? And and I want you to, you know, examine some of your, your reactions to it, and do you think that he truly figured out a secret to happiness? Um, you know, and we'll talk about it. Um, we'll talk about it later together, all right? So, well, I hope this has helped clarify some things, and uh, I look forward to talking with you soon. Bye now.